She's one of the largest subsea construction ships in the world, the North Sea Giant. This boat can do anything. Her mission is to build a factory 300 meters below the surface. These modules are basically like Lego. It's a job that requires special cranes. Come down half a meter. Robotic submarines. Oh, stop. And nerves of steel. Ah, it's too narrow, isn't it? Billions of dollars are at stake. This is the most critical phase. On a project the world has never seen before. When it comes to subsea construction, nothing matches Norway's North Sea giant. Her speciality is installing massive components for oil and gas facilities on the ocean floor. She stands 46 meters above the water and stretches 161 meters from bow to stern. A state-of-the-art propeller system enables her to turn swiftly and she has seven cranes for lifting and lowering cargo into the sea. The North Sea Giant is the undisputed flagship in the North Sea shipping fleet. Captain Bjorn Fjolsback leads a team of 114 crew, contractors and technicians. Its capabilities and equipment are unrivaled. For the past eight months, North Sea Giants has been working off the coast of Norway in the Norwegian Sea on the most ambitious undersea construction project ever. The world's first underwater natural gas compression station, 300 meters below the surface. The subsea factory will be hooked up to 11 existing natural gas wells. The compressor will add pressure to the gas flow so the wells can be productive for an additional 20 years. The purpose of the compressor station is to take more gas out of the reservoir. Morten Persson has spent the last four years on this project for Norwegian energy giant Statoil. Without the compressor station, we would uh, recover only 60% of the reservoir. It's the high point of his career. This is the largest subsea project ever. Uh, the size of the subsea compression station covers almost the football field. So for the subsea industry, this is really a step change. The $3 billion investment is expected to yield $12 billion in additional natural gas that will be transported by pipeline to Europe. The compression station has 29 modules. Now North Sea Giant will install the final components in the job. The world's first subsea compressor. Four stories high, it weighs 388 tons. It's the biggest, heaviest, and most important module in the entire operation. The compressor starts its journey in Kristiansund, Norway. After loading it on deck, North Sea Giant will sail 222 kilometers offshore to the Osgard gas and oil field. Then lower the compressor deep below the waterline into place on the sea floor. But before the ship can bring the compressor on board, let's make it four on the key side. A team of welders must clean up the deck. Cutting away scrap bits of steel lashing left over from previous transports. Oh, Marty, come back. Deck foreman Jamie Vollens, known to the crew as Jammer. That's a good speed, Derek. Keeps one eye on the work and the other on the clock. Ready, mate? Ready. Oh! You see? How much longer have you got left for this now? The biggest problems on the back deck is slip trips and falls. 
We have to make sure we gouge all the deck down, getting rid of all the trip hazards. Yeah, then we just swap over here. As welding continues, North Sea Giant arrives at the pier. The rush is on to get the compressor on the ship before nightfall. The first load to come on board is a giant frame weighing 50 tons. Easy on your tagline, Adam, not too quick. This will be the compressor's parking space on the ship. As, as it's coming round like that. Okay, Merrick, start coming down your line. We're getting better look. Meanwhile, it's time to move the compressor out of the hangar. To move a load this big requires not one, but two special transporters, which are operated by remote control. Their pilot is Shetil Svegen. You can uh, drive the forward, backward, diagonal, circle, turn around its own axe. Each transporter has 48 wheels. Right now we are using 24 axles and it has a capacity of 48 tons per axle. The compressor needs to move just 300 meters to the pier. But with almost 400 tons on board, the transporter's top speed is less than two kilometers per hour. Which means it will take the next 45 minutes for Chatil to get the compressor safely alongside the ship. It's a hell of a good job and it's not much operators in the world that does this. Each wheel on the transporters can rotate up to 260 degrees but the turns are still risky. A critical point is the hydraulic setup of the suspension. If that suspension setup is not correct, and the, the module will tip over and fall off the, the trailer. So that's the, 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 the worst-case scenario. Back on the North Sea Giant, the crane finishes bringing the smaller equipment on board. Now for the compressor. To lift a load this heavy, it takes a special crane. They call it the SHS, the Special Handling System. You see the SHS system? That's what picks up the module, and that is state-of-the-art equipment. One of the only ones in the world that does the job we do at the moment. The SHS is designed to carry loads of up to 420 tons. What makes it unique is that it can work in higher waves than any other crane on Earth, up to nine meters. But the SHS is located on the port side of the ship, so the first step is to turn the ship around. The maneuver takes just 10 minutes. Mission accomplished. I'm waiting for the ABs to call up uh, every second now to say that we're all fast. Chetil brings the compressor into position. For the first time in three hours, he can relax. It's now deck foreman Jammer's turn to move the compressor. SHS deck. Perfect. Right, Can we level up the sheave, please? The SHS is rigged with the load. Here we go, on the move now. It's time to bring the massive cargo on board. This is the heaviest load the SHS has ever lifted. The challenge will be to do it safely without damaging the ship or her precious cargo. On the west coast of Norway. Here we go, on the move now. 
one of the world's largest subsea construction ships, is lifting her heaviest cargo ever. Can we level up the sheave, please? We have to make sure the compressor is in a level position before we start taking it on board. Is it coming down, please? The compressor weighs almost 400 tons, enough to tip the ship on her side. Um, that wouldn't be too good. On the bridge, the captain initiates the ship's ballast system. This enables him to balance the ship as the load comes aboard. We have uh, four of ballast tanks with pumps that move water in between them. So when we take on the load on this side, we move water to the other side and the boat stays upright. Although the ballast system is automated, the captain has ultimate responsibility. As always, uh, things can uh, come to stop and it's better to have manual control here and that's what the mates are doing while I oversee the entire operation. As the special crane picks up the compressor, the ballast tanks fill with 500 tons of water, counterbalancing the load to keep both the ship and the crane steady. Unlike most cranes, the special handling system does not extend its arm. It simply pivots to deliver the compressor into the frame. Jammer returns to the ship to supervise the landing of the compressor on deck. It needs to land in the special cradle that's been bolted into the deck of the ship. Okay, SHS, you're a couple of meters away now. It's going to come down on the compressor itself and leave their CGF frame where it is. Yeah, copy that, mate. Carry on down. Come on now. So far, so good, no problems at all, nice and steady. Good operation awareness from the supervisor upstairs. You'll see the compressor coming down and, and the bumper bars, it will settle into place. Okay, when you're ready, to come down to the main lift. Locking pins from the cradle slide into the compressor's struts. It's now virtually part of the ship and won't slide around in heavy waters. By dusk, the compressor's fully installed. The next morning, it's time to leave the dock and head towards the Osgard gas field. I'll just come a bit more astern and then we'll go out into the bay. On the way, they will measure the wet weight of the compressor in the outer harbor. The compressor will be lowered off the side of the ship, long enough for its hollow, perforated frame to fill with water. Then the crew will test that the giant's special handling system is strong enough to pull the waterlogged compressor back up, just in case it ever has to be recovered. We'll go away from the berth out into the basin here and lower it down, uh, say, 50-odd meters. Wait until all the uh, members are water-filled and uh, pick it up again. The compressor is not the only thing taking the plunge today. Two submersible robots called ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, will also be making the trip to keep an eye on the compressor. The ROVs have their own cranes that place them in the water, keeping clear of the hull. The submersibles are operated from the ship's mission control room. With just a few joysticks, ROV pilots can control their cameras, navigation and robotic arms. On the bridge, Captain Fjolsbach has brought North Sea Giant to the test location in the outer harbor. It's about 70 meters deep here, perfect for filling the compressor. 
with the ROVs in the water and the ship in position, the SHS crane can start the lift. But just as the compressor begins its ascent, the plastic, the perspex is lifted there, but... a loud grinding noise brings the lift to a halt. Mitchell Pike is the lead engineer for Statoil. Something has got caught and it shouldn't have happened because they are getting a live response up in the cabin there with what the weight is and they know it shouldn't be going above 388, so it basically it shouldn't have happened. Jammer spots the problem. One of the cradle's locking pins didn't fully retract, so it was scraping against the compressor as it rose. We just had one uh, small incident here with the sea fastening frame that you can see in front of us. We've inspected the, the module. There doesn't appear to be any damage. Everything's looking good and we're still safe to go. Once the compressor is installed out in the gas field, it will need to be retrieved for maintenance within five years. These modules are basically like Lego and they're designed to come up and down when they need any kind of work done on them. But when the compressor goes underwater, it will put on some weight. When it goes into the water, you can see the black dots all over the structure. They, these are letting water into the structure to make sure it doesn't implode when we send it down to the seabed. The compressor is built to survive a trip down to the bottom of the sea. But no one knows if North Sea Giant is strong enough to bring it back up. So before it's installed, crane operator Don Hamilton and the operations team want to test whether it can be recovered. We've never actually recovered a module yet, so we need to know for our benefit what it's going to be when we bring it out of the water. Because the module's hollow tubes and struts are perforated, it takes on water below the surface. That could push the giant's special handling system beyond its 420-ton limit. So, Johnny, what's the current weight down there? We've got 303 tons right. currently, subsea. The water is obviously coming into the structure, and so far we've just under 30 tons of water in there. If the wet compressor weighs more than the SHS can lift, then it will be stuck on the bottom of the ocean, and a $3 billion compression station will be useless. All right, well, let's give it another 15 minutes or so. And we'll have a chat with the captain on whether or not we try and give it a bit of a shake. After an hour, the compressor's hollow struts are filled with water. Now comes the stressful part. Setting zero point. Watch on the move. Oh. The crane measures the weight as it pulls the module back to the surface. We're looking at uh, how fast the water evacuates from the module. So just to understand the weight variation of the wet compressor versus a dry compressor. In the crane control room, the compressor's wet weight is revealed. 419 tons. We're very happy with the test today. This is successfully proven that we are under the 420, but only by a whisker. We can still use the SHS to recover this module in the, in the worst conditions we expect at Osgar. It's a big relief. With the compressor back on board, Captain Fuelsbag plots a course to the work site. We will now make our way out to the Oscar oil field, and it takes us about 11 hours or so. As the ship sets out to sea, Morton is worried about the weather. Uh, we will have a bumpy ride out because the, there is a little uh, gale coming in, the waves of five, six meters, but that will be great. And then we will go to the field and, uh, and do um, checking out on the pipeline. The next morning, North Sea Giant reaches her destination, 222 kilometers off Norway's west coast. 
The ship comes to a stop above the Osgard gas and oil field. You should be careful there. On deck, Jammer's crew fills a basket with tools. The ROVs will need them to close a valve on the pipeline, making it safe to install the compressor. This basket needs to go to the sea floor. But there's a problem. It's a windy day with five meter waves, too high for the utility cranes. So the gear won't be going into the water on the side of the ship. Instead, it will be going through the ship by way of the moon pool. The moon pool is situated in the center of the ship. We can launch and deploy modules, even up to 70 tons in real high waves. From a subship construction point of view, the system is ideal. The moon pool stretches 10.7 meters from the deck all the way down to the bottom of the ship's hull, providing critical shelter when the seas get rough. Can you send a crane over for me, mate? Empty hold. Now this machine here is about to go down the moon pool when we're ready. Just setting up a few things here. Basically, the tools in here get connected to the ROV. Despite all the ship's technological marvels, it still takes some muscle to get the crane's hook attached to the basket. Just going to take the chains off now, mate, and start skidding the basket in. The tools are ready for their 300 metre descent to the sea floor. Thanks to the moon pool and its crane, this gear can be delivered even in high waves. But the compressor is a different story. If the wind stays this strong, North Sea Giant may have problems delivering this billion dollar structure to the sea floor. And there is only one way to find out. One of the world's largest subsea construction ships has arrived at the Osgard gas and oil field, 222 kilometers off the west coast of Norway. North Sea Giant's mission is to install this massive compressor unit on the sea floor, 300 meters below the surface. I believe that the subsea compression station of this range is comparable with the developments in space. Uh, we can't get to this uh, plant to this depth with divers, so it all has to be installed and controlled and operated via uh, controlled uh, robots, the ROVs. And today, the ROVs have a critical job to perform. They need to shut off the flow of gas through the pipe directly below the ship. Only then will it be safe to lower the compressor. It will take all three submersibles to do the work. Technician Stein Atlas Sundland is in charge of the ROV bay. We're going to launch the ROV now. We're going to operate some valves on the seabed. So we're going to launch the torque tool, the big torque tool on the back deck. And then we're going to operate the torque tool with the ROV. Each ROV is equipped with two robotic arms, one for heavy duty lifting, the other for intricate work. The morning's high winds have died down, making it safer to lower the submersibles over the side of the ship. They are steered from this mission control room. David Jackson is an ROV pilot. Yeah, we'll fly with uh, this main joystick here, which moves up lateral in both directions, forward, backwards. It is really like a big PlayStation. To close the pipeline's valves, the submersibles take some tools from the basket that was lowered down through the moon pool. 300 meters below the surface, it is pitch black. The submersibles provide the only source of light. Okay, yeah, support one control. Construction supervisor Andrew Shuttleworth is in charge of the operation. We're going to step over now to the job and um, we're going to close the valve. Okay. 
And the idea of this valve is that we'll be doing a leak test and this is going to act as a barrier. It's going to shut off an area that we don't want anything passing through. On land, closing this valve would only take a few minutes, but closing one at the bottom of the sea by remote control is like performing construction in space. To turn the half-metre valve, the ROVs need this, the torque tool. Too heavy for the submersibles to carry, it's the last thing lowered down by crane from the ship. OK, if you can get your grabber ready, um, and grab on, and then we'll just continue to lower down with the crane. Just locate the valve. The ROVs will steer the torque tool into place, but they're not alone down there. Fish do cause us some issues. They can get in the way um, when we're trying to view things, and they also have an effect on if we, uh, they fly under the vehicle, a large fish would actually affect our auto depth, which would cause us to lift up quickly. The fish are also at risk. Natural gas is toxic to marine life, so the crew don't want any leaks as they close this valve. Yeah, we can confirm that that's now locked in position. The torque tool is now attached to the top of the valve. The next step is to power it up. It's in lock position and now we're running the tool. Okay, now we're running the tool. The tool needs external power to operate, so a delicate exercise begins. The hydraulic power hose is moved from the torque tool to plug into the power supply of an ROV. With the torque tool powered up, the ROV pilots can remotely control how much the valve turns. Clockwise and breakout torque of 56417 newton meters to close, yeah? Yeah, that's a proper do. Almost 14 million liters of natural gas flow through this valve each minute, and it takes three cranks on the torque tool to close it. So there you go, it's a, such a big valve, they've got to go back and forth a few times, like a ratchet idea, to, to finally close the valve off. The valve slowly closes, cutting off the natural gas supply to this part of the pipeline. With that done, it's safe to install the compressor. Confirm that. Five meters to start one. The weather is not perfectly calm, but it is uh, well within our operational limits. Yeah, we're ready to start uh, lifting the module now. It takes extraordinary strength to hoist this massive module. Each meter of steel wire weighs 45 kilograms, and the wire is double looped for the lift. We are having more than 400 tons in the special crane right now. The compressor module itself weighs below 300, but we have the lifting frame and the cursor frame. You see the orange frame all the way up there. In rough seas, the heaving of the ship on the surface could easily transfer to the load suspended from the crane, causing the compressor to bob up and down. But this crane has active heave compensation. That means the pulleys are engineered to counter the vertical movement of the waves and steady the load. The compressor's target position is 300 meters below the ship, with a margin of error of just a few centimeters. Four years of planning and innovation have come down to this. It is being tracked by the cameras on three ROVs. The compressor descends slowly, so the air in the hollow struts can be replaced by seawater. If it arrives on the bottom with air in its supports, the pressure will cause it to implode. With no air left inside the compressor, the captain turns the giant 90 degrees to port. 
This places the load over its final position on the sea floor, but it also exposes the starboard side of the ship to the wind. The entire mission depends on the ship staying still, so the compressor can be lowered exactly into place. For this, North Sea Giant relies on five Voigt Schneider tractor propellers. Unlike regular propellers, these act like egg beaters hanging down vertically under the ship. Each 5,100 horsepower propeller has six blades that can change angle second to second to push the ship in any direction, compensating for the wind and waves. And they keep us within 10 centimeters of the exact spot where we want to be. We have up to five meters wave height and uh, wind speed is about 35 knots. No one understands the challenge of tonight's mission better than Statoil project manager, Morton Person. We're gonna lower it down to 265 meters, entering the guideposts so it's guided. It guides it safely in between the other neighbor modules. The clearance area is less than one meter. When it comes down, it will land softly on a controlled landing system. With the ship in position, Andrew Shuttleworth takes over to direct the operation. The success or failure of this mission is on his shoulders now. Okay, come down eight meters. Yeah, you just lateral over to your left. That's fine, you stay there on post one. Andy will be responsible for lowering the compressor onto two guide posts. As the leader of this team, he gives orders to the crane, the ROVs, even the bridge. Okay, just stand by on the vessel moves, got a few meters to run, just stand by. Okay, just come down five meters, uh, speed point three. This is the most critical phase. What's happening now is that we are lowering the uh, compressor module onto these uh, guide posts. They are quite tiny, as these are 12 inch in diameter and 16 meter high. This is really a critical operation. We can easily bend these uh, guide posts. It is a matter of fine positioning the vessel. We're going sideways or forward aft in steps of 0.5 meters. And we're waiting for the correct time when we can lower it down. To see what's happening, Andy relies on the ROV's 12 cameras. Okay, if we come down half a meter, speed point one. Coming down half a meter, speed point one. The ROV images reveal a problem. One guidepost should be taller than the other, but they are actually both the same height. This is almost impossible the way they're both level like this. This means Andy will have to land the compressor on both guideposts simultaneously. Threading two needles at once, 265 meters below the surface. Okay, come down another half a meter. Coming down another half. Point one. Oh, stop. Oh, stop. Andy needs the white guideposts to fit into the yellow funnel-shaped holes in the compressor. This is where the multi-million dollar investment in the SHS crane is supposed to pay off. We can see the wire down to the compressor module. It's going over those sheaves. When the vessel goes up, the winches pay in. And when the vessels go down, the winches pay out. This dynamic system is called active heave compensation. The movement of the vessel is plus minus uh, one meter up and down, while the module only moves plus minus 10 centimeters. Down below, bridge control. The crane has lowered the compressor to just above the two posts. 
kill off one meter on three one seven. One meter on three one seven. Yeah, speed point one. This is the hardest part. Even a near miss is dangerous. If the guide posts are bent or broken by the compressor, this installation will have to be called off. But each time they line up the funnels over the posts, the compressor drifts away. Its position needs to be accurate to within 20 centimeters on top of both guide posts at once. Well, the weather at the moment's a bit of a problem. We've got to come round, so the weather's beam onto us, so we're getting some movement with the vessel. The wind is hitting the side of the ship at 65 kilometers per hour, and she's struggling to stay in position. Okay, uh, bridge control. What? Okay, let's try half a meter, zero, four, seven. Half a meter, zero, four, seven. Yeah. Andy asked the bridge to slightly alter the ship's position so the compressor will line up above the posts. Up on the bridge, the captain and his mate are manually adjusting the ship's position, battling the wind to keep the compressor on top of its destination on the sea floor. The ship's special propeller system is designed to compensate for heavy winds. But these are the strongest North Sea Giant has ever faced when lowering a module. And the air is under pressure now. We can break the guide posts and then we have to abort the operation. Stop. This is the most critical moment. We have done it before, but today is the worst weather conditions. We have the wind and the waves almost in directly in from the side of the ship. Come on, point one. It's too, uh, it's too narrow, in it? Okay, uh, see, I'll shoot across now to support one. Go over the other one. Let me see that guy post there, one. Andy has finally been able to position the compressor above the first post, but there's still more to do. I'll come up any more, I'll lose that one. Once again, the strong wind pushes the ship and the compressor out of position, so Andy calls in some help. Well, we'll get the ROVs to grab on to the corners so we can get there, get them to start helping us to orientate, just to get me in the area yeah, yeah, I want yeah. to be. Just give it a bit of a nudge there, please. So far, the ROVs have just been watching the action. Keep coming down, come down one metre. Now they use their claws to nudge the compressor into position. Andy hopes that the ROVs will be able to steady the compressor so he can lower it onto both guide posts at the same time. OK, once you get yourself in position, tempers are good, I'm going to continue down. Yeah, good. OK, let's say chest control. Go ahead. OK, continue coming down at point one. Continue so coming down at point one. With the ROV's help, the compressor finally lands on both of the guide posts. Yeah. Support one, your tether. Good job, Andy. It can now slide all the way down to the subsea compression station. Baltics. Stand by there. After working through the night, the compressor is finally in place. As morning breaks, North Sea Giant enters the history books landing the compressor with unparalleled precision. But this achievement will mean nothing unless the ROVs can connect the compressor to the rest of the station. The compressor is the last module for the new subsea natural gas extraction system, 300 meters below the surface. New pressure will be added to 11 natural gas wells, extending their life by 20 years. But the compressor needs to be plugged in to become operational. Mitchell Pike is the lead engineer for Statoil, the company that owns the compressor and operates the gas field. The compressor obviously needs power to run. 
Wonderful, thank you. Once this connection is made, we'll be able to start up our compressor and, and start pr compressing the gas. Okay, just continue. The compressor needs 12,000 volts to operate, so its power plug is huge. It weighs as much as five cars. It's the largest subsea power connector in the world uh, with the highest capacity. It's a massive step in technology, but this is what's required to power our a large compressor module. The connector is so big, it must be lowered like a drawbridge from the module next to the compressor. All stop on break. The bridge is in place. That's good, we are happy with that. But before the plug can be slid into the socket on the compressor, the ROVs have to clean grime off the exposed connectors. The risk for us during this part of the operation is we have exactly 24 hours to complete the connection. So it means that we have to be very sure that things are going to go uh, well before we start. The ROVs will use a high-pressure water jet to clean the prongs and sockets before the salt water creates corrosion. But in the control room, the ROV operators discover a malfunction. The water jet isn't working. So the ROV is sent back up to the ship for repairs. Mechanic Rolf Utney has to investigate. We didn't have any flow and pressure on the water jetting system. Rolf checks the pipes and pumps for broken parts and blockages. So right now we are trying to pump fresh water through the system. Something is keeping the water stuck inside the ROV. I think it's the valve. We don't get any pressure out of the valve, so That's it valve. may not be the pressure washer. No. But the compressor's exposed plug and socket will be damaged by the salt in the seawater within 24 hours. So this has to get fixed now. If one of the parts needs to be replaced, it could take days to arrive. We are at this stage under uh, quite a pressure. So far, Rolf has ruled out faulty pumps and clogged lines. 3A, ready when you are. Now he's testing the valves. So we just tried to swap output valves on the ROV and uh, it works. The ROV is now ready for action. The ROV returns down to the sea floor. The water jet sprays the exposed connectors on the compressor and the high voltage power coupling. With the cleaning finished, the giant plug can be finally pushed into the compressor. We've had a successful uh, connection for our high voltage bridge. So uh, this is a fantastic milestone for the Osgar subsea compression project. Obviously, for the compressor to work, it needs electricity. So uh, this is a very, very important milestone for us today. The compressor is connected and powered up. After eight months of work by the giant, the world's largest subsea compression station is complete. This is, in fact, a very large success for the North Sea giant. It proves, again, that it is the most capable ship in the North Sea. Well, to be here 265 meters over the compressor station gives me enormous good feeling. We have been uh, working three years for this project. There are 29 structures down there. 22 of them has been installed from this vessel. To complete this historic mission, North Sea Giant has relied on every one of her advanced technologies. The moon pool. Three ROVs. Schneider tractor propellers, and most of all, her special handling system crane. I must admit, I'm very proud to be part of it. I was in Finland the day we cut the first deal for the SHS, and then to see it sitting here today, our special crane working as it's intended, 
I, it's, it's a very proud moment for me and everyone else in Statoil and our, our, our contractors. For Morton, the Osgod project is the kind of job he'll tell his grandchildren about. The North Sea Giant is, is the vessel we've been looking for for this job. This boat can do anything. The Giant is truly one of the mightiest ships on the seas.